he was careful to the point of paranoia. He would log in only from public libraries. He used different public. He went to links that most people wouldn't go to. And they tied his wallet ID to his name and they arrested him at a public library. And so, you know, obviously something like Monero would let you avoid that and they, the authorities wouldn't be able to, you know, to do that. And so it, it provides a conveyance that works around capital controls and censorship and other, um, you know, government overreach in all of its various, uh, you know, forms. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Keith Weiner, CEO of Monetary Metals, a platform for products that offer investors a yield on gold paid in gold. Keith shares why he believes in the gold standard and his reasoning for why he does not see crypto as capable of being a better form of money. Unfortunately, Keith's time was limited, so Doug was unable to fully dive into Monero with Keith to explain the nuisance of things like Monero's fungibility and tail emission in comparison to gold. But perhaps this is for the best, allowing Keith to take a closer look at Monero before getting back together for a part two. Monero Talk starts now. Keith, what's going on? Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we're already having great convo here. It's so uh, as you as we were saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a New York native, and it sounds like uh, you, you're you're quite familiar with New York yourself from your earlier I, days. I was a New York native. Now now I'm an Arizonan. And surprised to learn you were a software developer. I didn't I didn't know that about you. I I, I must admit I don't I don't know much about you. I saw you on Twitter, people retweeting you. You were talking about Bitcoin. And then I saw that you were a gold guy. Um, and I was like, you know what? I would love to talk to you, a gold guy about Bitcoin. Been trying to do that for quite some time. Obviously, Peter Schiff is, you know, kind of the w most well known in, in that category. Mm -hmm. But um, I was looking at some of your tweets. I was like, I want to talk to Keith. I want to find out. Uh, what he what he thinks about Bitcoin uh, from the perspective of somebody who's kind of a gold bug first. I don't know if it's, is it fair to call you a gold bug? Is that a, uh, you know, that... it depends on the context. Um, I, I, I think I have a bit of a different view uh, than certainly than Peter and, and many of the others about, you know, gold, you know, so I, I guess let me take a step back. First thing is, are we talking investment or speculation thesis? Or are we talking monetary standard and monetary economics? Um, and my arguments about about gold are mostly about the monetary economics angle. Um, we do publish, and in fact, um, was it last week, the week before, our uh, monetary metals, our annual gold market outlook, 2022, where we talk about, you know, all the macro trends and you know what's happening in the gold market, and why. So we do have some analysis of the gold price. Okay. But um, most of my conversation is about the you know, monetary economics of it what makes something suitable as money, um, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm more interested in, the, in that aspect anyway, and I think most people listening to this show are. Um, so I guess that, that would be my first. What, what, what does make something money? What, what, what qualities does something have to have to, to be money or the best form of money? So um, Carl Menger, the founder of the, of the Austrian school, uh, defines it as the most marketable commodity. And I think, so, so you have, so you have genus and differentia, right? You have commodity as the genus. And I think that, you know, we're physical beings that live in a physical world. There is a time, not everybody and not all the time 
but there's a time when you need to be able to take your marbles home and not play in the, you know, in the system at all. And uh, but that means taking home a physical good. You're, you're a physical creature. You live in a physical home. You need to take something home and say, I'm done. I've gotten final delivery, final payment. This is that I'm, I'm holding it. And when you look at all the various commodities, people talk about crude as a currency, for example, crude oil. You know, the amount of crude oil to, to be the equivalent value of a new car would be like a swimming pool full of the stuff. And it's smelly and it's toxic and it's volatile and it's flammable and it degrades when exposed to oxygen and sunlight. So, you know, the idea of where would you like your tanker trucks, your convoy of tanker trucks to deliver your crude, sir, you know, it just becomes highly impractical. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of reducing things to, the, to something that's perceptually obvious. With the same amount of gold um, as, as that value of crude oil, uh, it would be about the size of a, of a large format iPhone. You could stick it in your pocket and walk down the street. And so the the value density of gold, uh, you know, is definitely a factor. So uh, so that's Janice as, as commodity, and and I think that's why it has to be a commodity. Differentia most marketable. So there's lots of different commodities, um, but marketability refers to if you trade in and out of that commodity, you incur a certain loss, and that loss is the measure of its bid ask spread. So the um, money is the most marketable commodity. It's the one with the least losses, the least friction. If you think about money as a, as a lubricant, it's an indirect medium of exchange and a lot of other things, you want it to be the thing that you don't lose a lot to get paid in money. And then you turn around and pay for the next thing that you want in money. Um, so you want the thing with the narrowest uh, bid-ask spread. To which I would add, uh, you also want something whose marginal utility is not diminishing. So that's a technical economic jargon term. I don't know how many listeners would be familiar with that. Marginal utility refers to the value of the nth plus one unit. Um, and how do you how do you um, compare that to the value of the nth unit? And so I, I live in a hot desert here in Phoenix. In July, it could be 120 degrees. That's not an exaggeration. Suppose you were wandering around in the desert. Uh, very quickly, you would be thirsting to death. So imagine you came across some guy who had an SUV and out of the back of the SUV, he's selling one liter bottles of water. What would the first bottle of water be worth? Um, you know, it would be worth your life. You would open your wallet, you'd open your bank account for it because you're about to be dead. What would the second liter be worth? Well, that's a spare maybe to get you back to civilization. So you'd buy that too, although probably not at quite the same dear price. What would the third leader and the fourth leader be worth? And by the fourth or fifth, you basically get to it's worth zero. Right. It's dead weight that's holding. You don't even want it. And so every commodity has a diminishing marginal utility that the next unit is worth less than the previous and, and so on. Well, think about money for a minute. This is the thing that we use as the unit of account in measuring our, you know, our businesses. And everybody measures their net worth. If you're using some diminishing unit, to measure your net worth, you have the problem that you can't really tell if you're getting richer or if the quantity of this thing is increasing. I liken it to imagine um, engineers and architects, if they had to use meters that somehow shrunk as you went up in altitude. So then you'd have, you know, by the 80th story of a skyscraper, you know, the meter would be about this wide. And then you'd have to speak of story adjusted meters. Uh, the way economists speak of, you know, inflation adjusted dollars, how would anybody be able to build a building taller than, you know, ground floor? I don't know. Um, you know, nothing would stand straight. It would all be crooked because inflation adjusted or story adjusted would be at best, a, you know, imprecise art. And um, the thing about gold is that it's been mined more or less continuously, as far as we know, for 5,000 years. A friend of mine wrote a book called The Dawn of Gold, in which he argues, no, it's actually 13,000 years that Neanderthals were picking gold nuggets out of the stream beds 13,000 years ago. Um, we don't know that, but it's certainly been a very long time. Um, all the gold mined in human history with very little loss is still in somebody's hands somewhere in the world today. And so, um, which means is we just keep accumulating it. There's no such thing as a glut in gold. There's no such thing as a shortage. And that what that means is 
the marginal utility of gold is not diminishing. After 5,000 years of accumulating it, uh, the, the marginal you know, utility or the marginal value of the next unit of gold hasn't yet fallen below the marginal cost of mining it, which is not true for any other commodity. You'd have a glut and then you know, the price would collapse and you wouldn't get more production until the, the price picked up again. So, so there's some things about gold that are, that are unique. That stability is a very important thing when you think about, you know, both as a means of payment and also as a means of a long-term, you know, the, the, the unit in a, in a long-term contract, whether it's a rental contract, you know, lease agreement on real estate, whether it's an employment contract, or um, whether, it's, whether it's debt, you borrow, um, that stability is a very, very important thing that, um, you know, over thousands of years, gold developed that and um, nothing else, you know, really comes close to it. So you, you see gold as the, the kind of the best form of, of money that we have, that we know in the universe, that, that it, it has these certain qualities or attributes that make it better, collectively better than any, anything else that we have access to. That's right. And, 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 and by, by a country mile, I mean, it's not close. There isn't a second. The second closest thing would be silver, which is off by a mile when it comes to stability, for example. Yeah, and so why, 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 why the difference between gold and silver? What's the major distinction there? So obviously, gold has always been viewed as the junior, you know, monetary metal. Um, it's a very interesting question. I don't think there's been a lot of discussion of this, even in the gold book community. Why two? Why two monetary metals? Um, everything, you know, tends to converge on one winner take all. You know, you look at at the internet. It's 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 IP protocol, and and there once had been you know other protocols, uh, you know IBM had NetBIOS and you know there were other things you know historically, but uh, the winner tends to gobble up every everything else. Um, so why why two? And I think the answer is um, gold was the best money for conveying value over great distances. So there there could never really be a price differential between gold in New York, gold in Zurich, gold in Shanghai, because it's only, you know, one plane trip. And because the value density is so high, it doesn't really cost very much to put it on a plane. It's less than 24 hours and not very expensive to bring it anywhere else in the world. And so it has a uniform value. To get the same value in silver is is something like 150 times the bulk. So what would fit in your pocket in, uh, in gold would weigh 75 times as much. So that would probably be a bit more than you'd want to put in a backpack. And the bulk would probably be, you know, uh, also pushing. I, I, I threw it back. I guess the bulk wouldn't be, you know, it's the weight that would really kill you. Um, so I think silver uh, evolved as the best, uh, best money to carry value over time for wage earners and small savers. So think of a skilled blue collar trade uh, putting 10% of his weekly wage into, you know, into savings. Um, gold is just impractical to get small amounts of gold like that. It's expensive and, you know, you're either not getting something that's really tangible. You can see like a little one gram bar and the, and the premiums are, are very high versus a one ounce, you know, one or one or two, one ounce silver coins. It's tangible. You can hold it in your hand easily. Um, and then the, the, uh, the premium, you know, the, the manufacturing cost above the cost of the value of the metal is much lower uh, in silver, you know, for that value than versus in gold. So it's literally, literally the density of it, the fact that you could store more value per per unit, per well, mass. That, if you're doing small amounts, silver gives you a tighter bid-ask spread. In other words, it's more marketable in small amounts and gold is, is, more, is the most marketable but you have to have kind of a minimum quantity before gold's superior marketability uh, uh, beats gold, uh, beats silver. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, I assume you think that it wouldn't be practical to use gold physically to to transact value all the time. That gold should be something that's that's kind of the the you know the base layer, and then something like uh, a fiat or some note uh, on or fiat maybe is the wrong language to use some type of note would be on top that's then then backed by the gold in terms of value 
so that people can easily transact that way. And then eventually, uh, digitally, uh, people are sending around units digitally, but it's ultimately would be somehow backed physically by gold. Is that how you kind of see things yeah, I mean, operating? Back in the time of, of the classical gold standard, that's what it was. It was, um, you know, you didn't necessarily carry around a purse full of jingling gold coins. You know, in, in 1850, they would have said that's medieval. You know, walk around in a sackcloth robe and have a little rope belt and a, you know, leather purse jingling along. You know, that's they were civilized by 1850. And yeah, you have a you have a banknote which gives you, um, you know, smaller denominations. Um, you know, one ounce of gold is a pretty big, always has been. It's a pretty big chunk of, of money. Um, you know, you could buy, you know, maybe not a decent used car, but you could buy a used car with an ounce of gold. You could buy, I don't know, it'd be quite a year's worth of groceries, but um, certainly several months worth of groceries. And, and it's always been like that. So, um, you know, for day-to-day -day use, if you want to go and buy a coffee and, and a burger, you know, it just wasn't practical anyway, but you could, you could deposit it in a bank and get small bills and they were much more, uh, you know, much more convenient. Today, obviously digital, um, you know, I, I think people would have it on their Apple Pay wallet, um, you know, in their, you know, credit card of choice or whatever, however the world is, the world of payments is going. The, the key for me is that you have the right, but not the, you know, the obligation, but you have the right to redeem for your gold if you want it. That's, that was the, the probably most significant change of everything that's happened in American history. And there's been a whole series of adulterations of the money. In 1933, we went from, you could hand in your $20 bill and get one ounce of gold, one ounce of gold, to no longer is it possible to redeem that paper. Now the paper becomes irredeemable, meaning it's a promise to pay that is dishonored and promises not to pay. So it becomes a, a contradiction and then a meaningless unit. I mean, what is the dollar worth? Well, you know, go, go to your local McDonald's today and find out what they think it's worth. And what will they think it's worth tomorrow might be a different, a different worth than it is today. Um, so it's important that people have the, the right to redeem, which is what keeps the banking system honest. You know, that most people won't redeem most of the time until a bank begins to cheat. And the moment that big bank begins to cheat, then they're going to find that redemptions are, um, you know, outnumbering uh, deposits and that will force them you know, back into line. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Now, I don't know how we've gone this far. I've already 15 minutes in it. I didn't mention Bitcoin or Monero yet, but, uh, you know, I, I think that's okay. I, I, I want to, um, I really want to first really understand um, how did you arrive at uh, having these beliefs in, in gold and gold being kind of um, the ideal form of money? Is it what took you here? How did, how did you become a gold bug? I, I don't want to call you a gold bug if you, if you don't like, uh, I don't know what the proper term is, but you know, kind of a, somebody who believes that gold should be the standard form of money. How did you, you know, so as, as, as I was saying before we started the recording, um, I, I was your classic computer nerd in high school, went off to uh, computer science school, dropped out because I thought I had gotten everything I could, at least at the undergraduate level um did did some software development and eventually started uh or, you know relatively soon uh started a software company called diamondware and um diamondware you know we went through a couple of different business models in the early days uh but ultimately we we're developing you know, kind of a cool 3d spatial voice over ip technology um so it, it uh is way cooler than everything we're using today with skype and zoom all the rest of these things are pretty primitive compared to what we had working in 2005. Cool. But um, be that as it may, um, I sold the company in 2008. The transaction closed August 19, 2008, and the acquirer was Nortel Networks. So, you know, if anybody's interested, can Google Nortel acquires Diamondware, and you can see the the value of the deal and everything else, which isn't that important. Um, but um, as a matter of historical record, we were the last acquisition Nortel ever closed. Uh, I knew several other companies that were in the process uh, that didn't close because Nortel began to collapse. Um, 
you know, almost immediately. Um, so, uh, you know, I think September 2nd, they went out to Wall Street and said uh, the wheels are coming off. Rumors began to swirl that they had hired bankruptcy counsel, which all turned out to be true in a couple of months. You know, so they had um, a big 15% layoff in, in September of 08. Then they had an 8% in, in October, another 10% in November, another 10% January 09, and then they finally declared bankruptcy. And um, so all through this, I kind of felt the whole thing was very surreal. I felt very bemused. Um, the only way I can describe it is the life of an entrepreneur is not what most people would call normal, you know, to begin with. And then the life of an entrepreneur going through an acquisition like that made, you know, life prior to that look normal by comparison. It's very intense. You know, every, every email is a crisis that if you don't resolve it, the whole deal is going to be off. And, um, a lot of crazy stuff, you know, happened and you finally get the deal done. You're like, Phew. you know, and, and you get to a, a different place, but then you realize, you know, essentially my entire career, you know, just come to an end. And now I have a completely new role. Like for 14 years, my job was to build this business. Then for eight months, my job was to get the acquisition done. Then, okay, now I begin the you know, new role as the middle manager in a large corporation. Uh, not a role I had ever had in my career, you know, before then or since I met Ed. Um, and so in all those changes are going on. And obviously I've, you know, realized a, a pretty significant chunk of change out of that transaction and transaction. And then meanwhile, all this stuff is going on. And at first I'm like, wow, you know, everything's going on sale. I could buy this. I could invest in that. I could do all these things. Um, my investment banker who, uh, Actually, first I'll tell you, he calls me up in October, so what, you know, two months after the transaction, and he says, Keith, you are the luckiest beep man in the world um, for the timing of all this, because if you'd gotten the deal done in May the way you originally thought we might, um, you know, who knows what you might have invested in, that would all now be, you know, losing money. And um, what was really telling about that call was he had been diagnosed with late stage cancer in the middle of the transaction and handed off the whole thing to myself and my advisor. And I, re I recall one, one phone call where he said, you know, guys, this, you should assume this is the last time you ever talked to me. I'm checking into the hospital. And, um, you know, there was a weekend where the doctors gave him 50, 50, whether he would live or not. Oh, wow. So he survived that and recovered and, you know, went on to do, you know, his bucket list and everything else. Um, but for him to be calling me the luckiest man, it was, just, it was just the whole thing was just very weird. Uh, it, it felt so different from anything I'd ever seen in my life to that point. Um, anyway, so somewhere in the fall of 2008, I began to start to try to study first markets just to figure out how to protect myself because I'd made this money. Um, and then economics, as I realized this goes way deeper. And, you know, you, you see what they're saying on TV and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. They're starting in the middle. And it's like brownie in motion. They're just swirling around, going nowhere. And um, even the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, you know, none of it really made any sense. So I, you know, I turned to the internet. I came across every site, you know, you can imagine. Started to read every author. I got every every major guy's book or a couple of books. Read all that stuff. I, I kind of felt like a moth drawn to a flame. It was like seven days a week, ten hours a day of just obsession of, you know, what is going on. And, um, uh, you know, eventually came across this crazy old Hungarian professor who had some different set of ideas around this guy named Fekete. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know if he's right or not, but he's the only one who seems to be asking questions that try to get to the root of all this. And um, so ultimately became a student. Ultimately, I was granted uh, a PhD um, and um, not accredited. I could never get a job with that degree, but the work was real. Uh, and, you know, the more that I think about money, the more that I think about what are the requirements for, for money to do the things that people need of money to do, then, you know, the answer became, you know, clearer and clearer. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say obvious. It's not, nothing is obvious about this. And we live in a world that we're so proper, we're so awash in propaganda from the time we're two that, you know, if you go to Google images or Bing images and you say, and you search for money. You get page after page after page of pictures of paper with green ink on it. That's what people think money looks like. You don't get gold coins. 
or gold bars, you know, you get you get that. And um, so in this world of propaganda, it's not obvious and not easy to see, you know, what what you require of your of your monetary, you know, good, your monetary substance. Um, but that was that was kind of my journey, and that's that's why. So when I started my second company, I said, you know, in the normal world, I would have done another software company. I mean, I had a team that had followed me to hell and back, uh, almost literally a diamond where they were ready for the next gig, were ready to, to jump with you the next thing. We certainly had plenty of ideas, had access to capital. Um, I think I'd learned a thing or two about how to do a business like that during my, my tenure building that up. But I said, you know, sorry guys, but um, my next gig has to be trying to do something with this money thing. Uh, and so in 2012, I, I started Monetary Metals to to try to solve this problem amazing i i love this story so this 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 is very interesting so i mean you seem to be like kind of at the perfect place at the perfect time in terms of um you know it, what, the knowledge base you have and your experiences you know experiencing 2008 the way you did um you're a software guy you got interested in money and understanding what you know what money really is um, so then what is your Bitcoin story? Cause that, that in my mind, you know, if you would have just kind of given me that resume, I'd be like, okay, now that at some point this guy discovers Bitcoin and becomes, you know, a crypto guy, Bitcoin guy, maybe eventually a Monero guy, we could talk about that. So mm -hmm. what happened? What, what, what was your crypto story? At what point did you kind of confront crypto and how what why have you kind of passed it up or maybe you haven't maybe i don't know enough about you what 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 is your take on crypto and how you know how did you first discover it um you know i i mean i guess as befitting any um technology guy you tend to be aware of tech trends before you know the mainstream public mm -hmm. um you know i had a i had a cell phone in 1995 probably oh wow uh you know i don't think most people you know had that i had an email address well i, I so a diamond where i registered at dw.com back at a time when you had to fill in a piece of paper and send it by snail mail so isn't that ironic you register your domain name by mailing a letter to something at that time it was called the internet capital n-i-c and you put it put down your you know your three choices top one two and three you know if they couldn't give you number one they give you number two and I said oh well Diamondware right DW and they gave us DW so that was there's only what you know twelve or thirteen hundred two letter domains you know possible because it can be letters and numbers and um, you know I, I got DW.com in ninety four oh wow um, I remember being frustrated with you know like trying to buy car insurance or something like that saying can I email you something. And, the, and you know and the insurance agents never had didn't have email at that time so you know always been kind of a bit you know on the on the early edge of tech just because you know you know, was, was in the business not not anymore but um so you know on when did i become aware of bitcoin i think i wrote a few articles about it in 2012. Mm. um so i'd been aware of it before then but that was the first time i wrote about it and i looked at it and said um i mean by that time Right, so I got my my PhD in 2012. So by that time, I'd already studied all this monetary economics. I wasn't beginning my my monetary, you know, economic journey at, at the time that I discovered Bitcoin. I think for most people, you know, the introduction of the Bitcoin is, is their first introduction to the monetary topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most people just kind of accept that you know the dollar is money, the dollar's fine. Well, yeah, you know, there's inflation, but, you know, I'm sure the Fed will figure it out. You know, we'll muddle through. We always do. Um, and, um, you know, and boy, are they putting a lot of faith in something that doesn't deserve it. But that's a whole nother discussion. Um, so anyway, by the, by the time I discovered Bitcoin, I was already sort of fully formed, as it were. But, you know, I looked at it. So, OK, this is interesting. Um, I think I, I think I had three thoughts three or four thoughts at that time one it's irredeemable so, okay you've got this thing that's cool and it has some really interesting cryptographic properties which as a computer guy i get and um some of the ideas that we were exploring myself and my team in the post diamondware 
you know, time. So we, we all ended up with jobs at Nortel. Nortel then sold the entire enterprise business, including Diamondware, to Avaya. So um, for everybody who's not familiar with it, when um, the uh, antitrust case busted up AT&T, they busted it up. Everyone knows the long distance and the local phone companies were separated. But the, the company that made the telecom equipment was also separated, and that was Lucent. In subsequent years, Lucent split itself into telecom, you know, carrier equipment versus enterprise equipment. And the enterprise stuff was split out into a company called Avaya. So Avaya bought um, the Nortel enterprise business uh, and that transaction closed basically just before the end of 2009. So we're all, you know, we're all there at Avaya. Um, I don't think anybody was really satisfied with the nature of what the job had become. We lost our mission. We lost our mandate. And now it was like, you know, go debug the server. And, you know, it, it wasn't, it was a job and nothing more. And this, this was a team that, you know, signed up for a mission. Um, so we were all talking about this and, and, um, several of the ideas that we were exploring were innovative ways to use cryptography, uh, to, you know, to, to try to give people the ability to take back some of their privacy and kind of tilt the, tilt the whole internet service, you know, world back in the favor of, mm -hmm. you know, consumer with a peer to peer kind of a play that, um, could, uh, um, you know, could accomplish that without really requiring the consent or permission or any kind of API integration with Google, Facebook, you know, any, anybody you could name. It didn't really, it was, it was a layer that we built on top of them that wouldn't, they wouldn't really have any control over it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I got cryptography and I was looking at Bitcoin. It's like, this is really clever stuff. And the blockchain, I got the double spend problem immediately. Um, but anyway, so I'm looking at it, so I was like, number one, it's irredeemable. What do you do if you need to take your marbles home? And, you know, by definition, I mean, you, you can't have a Bitcoin similar to have a dollar. You know, people bristle when I say it's a credit relationship. It isn't a credit in the sense of somebody formally owing you a debt, but it is to have a Bitcoin doesn't, isn't to have something. It means someone else maintains an entry on a ledger with, you know, with your number on it which isn't the same thing as holding a piece of gold in your hand. It's a quite different, you know, quite different thing. And, and I, I think that's very important. Uh, the other thing I looked at was, um, oh, and so I wrote an article called Bit Gold. Or I, maybe that wasn't in the title, but I, I proposed a thought experiment. I said, suppose you had a choice of two currencies. And of course, the time I wrote this, um, you know, Bitcoin was probably $30 or $50 or something. Boy, that seems quaint to look back that far. But I said, you know, suppose you had a choice of two currencies, Bitcoin, which is irredeemable, and um, and another one that's identical in every way in terms of the utility of the cryptographic security and, and, and so forth. However, it was redeemable for gold and, and call that bit gold in lowercase, um, you know, which, which would you choose? And um, I, I thought that was pretty obvious. And, and subsequently, I guess that becomes a lot less obvious. Um, there was a company that um, you know formed and called itself BitGold. And the CEO uh, of that company said that he got that name from that article back in, um, I don't know if that was 2012 or 2013 when I wrote that. Um, and they subsequently renamed themselves. They're not a blockchain company anymore. So they didn't think that was appropriate. Um, the other thing that um, I started to think about maybe it was a slightly later thought was the, the the price of bitcoin is set entirely it's not just set at the margin by speculators it's set entirely by speculation and um so something i think about a lot is that arbitrage as a process sets a stable you know if not price or at least ratio and all the physical things you know oil and um you know iron ore copper all the physical things are, are connected by a whole web, complex web of arbitrages. Um, but the price of Bitcoin, you know, set only by speculation. And a lot of people think that speculation will set a stable price, but actually it, it doesn't and it can't. And I haven't written to prove this yet. And so it's one of the things that I, I have to write at some point to get out there. Um, but so far, uh, obviously the Bitcoin price has proven to be not stable. And if it's not stable, that means nobody can borrow to finance 
a productive activity in it. No one can borrow Bitcoin to finance a farm or a copper mine or a factory manufacturing glass screens for, for iPhones um, or, or a company that's manufacturing alternators for cars or whatever. You couldn't finance it because it's not stable. And so, um, you know, if Bitcoin is to go up and up and up, which seems to be the, uh, that's certainly the premise, that seems to be the behavior is it goes up and up and up and then it crashes and then it goes up and up and even more. And so if you're a long-term, uh, you know, holder, that can be fine. But if you're a borrower, that would be deadly. So imagine, you know, you borrow $200,000 to buy a house and then, you know, within five years, you know, you owe $200 million. I mean, it would just bankrupt you. I mean, nobody could, nobody could do it. It'd be suicide. And so uh, as I look at that, I said, okay, that's another problem. Um, so uh, I, in 2017, I wrote, I don't know, 12 or 13 articles looking at different you know, aspects of this and, and arguing it doesn't really work as money. Um, you know, I get that it, it it's an end run around, um, we'll just call it, you know, government overreach. You know, so obviously everyone knows now that um, they tried to do a GoFundMe, I think, for the truckers in Canada. And, um, you know, the, the powers that be blocked that and, and I guess ordered GoFundMe to, you know, suspend that. So then uh, they're sending Bitcoin and Bitcoin gets through. And of course, as I'm, I'm sure you know, as a Monero guy, there's, the authorities have now said to the Bitcoin, the major Bitcoin exchanges, here's a list of 50 wallet IDs that were not, you are not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, to provide service to, to let these guys trade between Bitcoin and fiat. Mm -hmm. You have to ban these wallet IDs because everything on Bitcoin is is traceable. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not really anonymous, it's pseudonymous. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as Ross Ulbricht just, you know, discovered and others have discovered, if they really want to figure out what your wallet ID is, it just takes only one mistake. And if you have the resources of the state behind you, you can hunt and hunt and hunt and Ulbricht, you know, if you read about this guy, he was both very savvy about, you know, you know, ability to be traced and how to avoid being traced. He was a smart guy. And parent, you know, he was careful to the point of paranoia. He would log in only from public libraries. He used different public. He went to links that most people wouldn't go to. And they tied his wallet ID to his name and they arrested him at a public library. And so, you know, obviously something like Monero would let you avoid that and they, the authorities wouldn't be able to you know, to do that. And so it, it provides a conveyance that works around capital controls and censorship and other, um, you know, government overreach in all of its various, uh, you know, forms. And, and, and against that, I have to say, I, I agree with that. You agree with that as a utility? So a utility. I, I agree that it, it definitely does that, and there's utility there in doing that. That and Monero then, does that, or that you think Bitcoin does that as well, you're saying? Well, no? the, the, any of the cryptocurrencies is kind of an end run around government to some degree. I think Bitcoin is now going to be coming under increasing regulation, and that as AML, KYC, anti-money laundering, know your customer, OFAC database lookups become part of the required infrastructure at least for any exchange that's going to allow a trade between bitcoin and fiat as as all of that becomes you know required by the regulators right if you're coinbase and the regulators say do this it's not really a suggestion it's not really an, you know optional to you it's like you have to do it or they're going to shut you down and they have guys with guns that are you know can do it mm -hmm. so um as that happens anything that's traceable you know, the world is going to discover that Bitcoin doesn't really give you the anonymity. So, you know, people will turn to some other sort of coin. Now, you know, what you think about people bypassing the state is a whole different discussion. But I get that, um, uh, you know, people are going to turn to these things to do that. Obviously, you wouldn't want to you know, rely on bank wire transfers if you're doing something illegal. I mean, that would be kind of dumb. Um. Yeah, all all interesting points. So many so many things I'd like to kind of pull on there. So then overall, I guess so do you see Monero as having or if not Monero, the thing that that fulfills Monero the best. So the un, untraceable digital cash. Do you see that as being kind of the core value proposition of what crypto can be? I'd hesitate to call it the core proposition. 
um, I think, you know, irredeemable crypto isn't money. I don't, I don't think it works, you know, as, as money and, and both as a medium of exchange and as a, as a medium for either unit of account or borrowing lending, long-term contracts. I mean, nobody would set a wage and say, I'll pay you two Bitcoin a year as a salary in a 10 year contract. Because if you did right, that before you'd be bankrupt. Right, uh, yeah, I just so uh, so we're confl- so let's talk about that first then. So yeah, you you talk about the the redeemability, uh basically being able to bring your marbles home. Um essentially it sounds like you don't think something like a cryptocurrency can be money because ultimately it isn't gold. It's not backed by gold. So do you think that's just kind of because you're a gold first person because it sounds like your idea of redeeming is that you have to be able to turn it into gold then for it to be real money it can't just you know holding your private keys as a bearer asset i hold my monero why isn't that taking my marbles home why aren't those my marbles it's the same issue that, that occurs you, you know let's say amongst the gold standard community you know there can be a confusion between the paper banknote that says redeemable for an ounce of gold versus the ounce itself. And so, um, you know, I've, I've spoken at academic conferences uh, about this, and one in particular stands out in my mind. I'm, I'm going to, again, not mention the name to protect the, uh, the innocent and the guilty, I suppose. But, you know, at, at, this, at an academic conference at a university economics department, and most of the participants are professors or assistant professors or post-grad students or grad students or whatever. The speaker before me said only gold is money, nothing else. And his presentation was pretty lame because all he had was pictures of historic gold coins, which I suppose are interesting if you're interested in the history of that stuff. You know, the first gold coin in Lydia, 600 BC, blah, 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 blah. But he didn't really prove his thesis. And um, when he was done talking, they ripped him a new one. I mean, they were absolutely brutal, as only academics can be, I suppose. And I'm just biting my tongue because I knew that was going to be central to my talk as well. I'm like, all right, I got, I'm going to put the ship over here. You want to come on? And uh, and w- which they didn't do to me because I think I I proved my case a little better. But I said, um, you know, think back to a time in the gold standard, call it 1870, whatever, when you had this piece of paper that said, you know, redeemable, uh, you know, for for the for the one ounce um, gold coin at the time. Um, so the way this worked is, you know, you deposited gold and you got this piece of paper and the piece of paper is a receipt that said, you can get your gold back, or you can hand the piece of paper to someone else and he can get, you know, it's now his gold. He can get that back. So the paper is, is a bearer instrument of some sort, but, but the paper doesn't have any value other than that it's redeemable for the gold. Mm-hmm. So I, I said to this group, I said, you know, he, here's a question. I said, you owe yourself. I said, you don't owe me anything. I'm just a visitor. I'm just this American. So this is outside the US. I'm just this American who's come here to annoy you. You don't owe me anything, but you owe yourself an answer to this question and you owe yourself an answer with intellectual rigor. And that is if the word for the piece of paper that is redeemable for gold is money, then what is the word for the gold for, you know, when you pass that piece of paper to across the teller window, the bank teller pushes back the gold coin. If the word for the piece of paper is money, what's the word for the gold coin that it redeems for? Mm-hmm. Well, there was silence in the room and nobody even attempted to rip me a new one. Um, because, you know, I, I, I stumped them and that they hadn't thought about it in that way before, obviously. But, you know, it's a very serious thing. It's, it's, the, it's the confusion. Steve Forbes uses the analogy of you know, you, you go to a fancy restaurant, especially in New York. It's funny. We don't have this out here at all in Arizona. You check your coat at the coat check closet. You guys don't need and coats. Generally, <laughs> you know, this time of year, there's some people that are wearing, you know, sort of lighter coats. Tends to be less formal and less fancy anyway. But, you know, New York, you go to one of those places, you check your coat, and they give you this paper receipt that says, you know, coat number 1234 on it. Right. Nobody would confuse the coat check receipt for a coat. Nobody would think that the coat check receipt could keep you warm when you go outside and it's 15 degrees and the wind is blowing. Um, there isn't that confusion. The difference is that's a paper receipt that just, you know, essentially acknowledges that this custodian, you know, has has a coat with with your number on it. 
mm-hmm. um, and, and nothing more than that. But when it comes to money, that distinction has been like rubbed out and, and yeah. deliberately so with, with government taking so many actions, including propaganda and public schools and financial regulation and, you know, all the rest of that. And, and so that's, that's the sort of crux of the issue is with a piece of gold, you own a physical object in your hand with, with a Bitcoin, somebody else is maintaining a ledger. And on that ledger is a number that only you have the key to. Mm-hmm. I total I totally accept cryptographically that strong. Um, and that, you know, no one else can, you know, uh, match that entry in that ledger in such a way as to be able to spend it. They've solved the double spending problem. That's only yours right. to transfer as you want. But it's a number that someone is maintaining on a ledger. And so it's a, it's a third party that maintains this record on your behalf. But you it's just, a distributed third party. Right, I get it's distributed. It has a lot of really interesting properties. It's kind of like it's kind of like saying, um, hmm. I mean, so you, so you don't see the pri- holding the private key as holding a bearer asset. Well, I, I would use the word bearer instrument in the same way that holding. You know, holding that twenty dollar bill back in eighteen seventy, or for that matter, holding coat check number one two three four. I suppose if you were, I don't know, playing dice, you know, the way they used to in the Middle Ages at some fancy restaurant in New York today, you could lose your fur coat and then pass the, the claim check over to someone else, and right. that person could redeem it from the, the closet. Double, the double spent. So the whole invention is, and because it's a distributed network. Uh, is you know as long as you hold that key, you hold the crypto. Nobody else can go replicate the the key, make another version, spend it without you giving permission. Uh, the network essentially can't do anything to corrupt the key that you hold. So, I don't. I, how is it equivalent to the coat check uh, ticket? Uh, yeah, so in the code technology, obviously, I understand the fiat version of that, but I'm just not seeing why that then applies. In the code analogy, I'm not saying that somebody can forge it. Um, obviously, I mean it's just a little piece of cardstock. You know, somebody could somebody could easily forge it, but for whatever reason, maybe I, I suppose we should all be thankful we live in a civilization where people are honest enough that nobody's gotten into the scam of printing fake co checks to steal people's fur coats it was I've never read about such a thing so it's not, it's not, it's not a, analogy you're 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 saying you're trusting that the person that holds your coat will have it and when you show up with a, the ticket it's still going to be there to the issue isn't isn't the trust per se or the counterfeitability per se mm-hmm. although you write a co check just a piece of paper that can be easily counterfeited and you're right that in a certain sense you're trusting the coat check person not to go steal your coat. Um, but it's not, the, the, the root of the issue isn't either of those two things. The root of the issue is that the piece of paper isn't the coat, that the that the receipt isn't the, the receipt for the object isn't the object itself. Mm-hmm. And but you don't think the private key is the object? The, the, the private key is, is the receipt. Now it has cryptographic strength where no one else can forge that receipt and there's no way like, you know, if you're sitting at a restaurant table, suppose the other thing that could happen in a physical restaurant, suppose you were, you're holding the receipt like this, you know, somebody were fast and aggressive, he might swipe that out of your hand and, and run on by and run to the coat check closet while you're still sitting there saying, what just happened? Mm-hmm. Um, none of these things are possible with, with Bitcoin or Monero or any of them. And I, I totally get that. Um, and that. And that isn't my argument. My argument is it's still the receipt versus the object. And the object is, in this case, not an object. It's just an entry on a database maintained by, you know, a third party or a, a public distributed network of third parties. Um, but the bearer instrument itself, I guess, like a bearer bond, you know, let's not totemize or fetishize the the piece of paper itself, or in this case, the key itself. You know, maybe there's another analogy to the key to your front door of your house. The key isn't the house. You know, yes, it gets you into the house, um, but you know, it's the key and the house are two two separate. Uh, oh, in, in the case of crypto, it's both though. It's it's 
it's what gets you in, but it's, it's also what, where the, where the value lies. That's where you hold your, your crypto and anybody who holds that key holds the crypto. The network doesn't hold the crypto. The network is how people are, are passing the crypto along peer to peer. So is, is there, is there some level of distribution that would give you comfort where you would then start to maybe be more of a believer in this idea? It's, it's not primarily a comfort issue. It's not primarily a cast aspersions at the nodes or the miners issue. It's not a, could this be counterfeited? Could quantum computers break it? That's not really the root of my argument. A lot of gold people in frustration say, well, yeah, but if we have the end of the world and the electric grid goes down, then there'll be no internet, which is true. Um, although God help us all, if we get to that world, um, you know, the, the gold may not have value a anyways, it, it's not at, at, at root. It isn't, that isn't the issue. The issue is that, um, there's a time when you want to take your marbles home. And in this case, there isn't a marble. The marble has been virtualized and, um, you know, is, is a record in, in a database. Um, and. You know, I, I think that's one of those things that doesn't matter until it matters. And right now it doesn't matter. And so, you know, the market. Well, in what scenario would it matter? So, like, I, I took my marbles home. I hold my Monero private keys. In my mind, that's just as safe, if not safer, than holding a piece of gold. Like, I, I feel like by holding that, you know, I it, I, it feels even more unconfiscatable than, than gold itself because I could literally store it as I can memorize it in my head, right? So who, how, how could you possibly come, come take my memory? I think it kind of, kind of is reminiscent. I'm just old enough to remember the debates about the seatbelt laws when they first mandated seatbelts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people could certainly sync up scenarios in which it's better not to have a seatbelt because the car's going to be on fire and whatever you'd be better if you were ejected than stuck in this burning, you know, sure. death, death box. Um, which is true enough. I mean, there certainly are cases like that. And there are cases where if you had gold on your physical person, you know, you might get beat up or, or mugged or whatever. And, um, you know, nobody can steal something you've memorized, especially if they don't even know you even have it memorized, right? If you're crossing a border with mm -hmm. gold in your pocket, they certainly know that. If mm -hmm. you're crossing the border and you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin in an account, they wouldn't even know you had that, let alone have a means of getting the password from you. Mm -hmm. um, all of which is true. Um, I, I've had some, you know, discussions on Twitter about, about an issue that I'm not sure I've been able to articulate it clearly within the limits of, you know, 288 characters or less. <laughs> um, and that is, yeah, I'm trying to think, how do I organize this thought? Um, People assume, you know, Bitcoin people assume that Satoshi and or others have proven certain things to be true. It kind of reminds me of the, of the, of the climate debate. Um, but there's but there's a Martin Bailey kind of kind of fallacy or a, a switcheroo. And they think that, you know, what, so what actually has been proven is the cryptography that you can't double spend. And of course, it relies on cryptographic work that long predates, you know, Bitcoin. That um, there's no way to break, you know, to break the hash other than by brute force. And then we know, given the length of the of the key, you know, how many ten to the how many years it would take the fastest supercomputer in the world to break it, which is more than good enough. That's all been proven. Um, and if you want to argue against that, you're arguing against the best math minds in the world. Um, you know, about that. And of course, there's always conspiracy theories. The NSA has smarter math people than everyone else. They've already broken it. You know, I don't entertain that kind of stuff. Um, but what they haven't proven is that um, the system will remain, uh, rather, the value that you think you're holding there will remain safe and secure and yours forever. And that is a very different thing that is very much harder to prove because it involves so many other things including you kind of have to prove that the incentives that that operate on the nodes and the miners will remain the same or at least won't change drastically enough 
that all the miners and, and node administrators wouldn't um, have an incentive to do something. And so, so one thing that I've poked at a bit, actually two things I've poked at a bit. One is when the, when the DAO was hacked, the very first DAO, I guess, um, the powers that be that ran the Ether network actually reversed it. Mm -hmm. And Not I thought, yeah. so at, at, before it happened, I said, as a computer guy, you know, these smart contracts are computer code. And if there's a bug in there, there's a real problem and there will be a bug sooner or later because to say that my computer code is perfect is a very difficult thing. So anyway, there was a bug. And then I said, this will be interesting to see how they play it because if they allow the theft to occur, then they might kill the nascent DeFi space. But if they reverse it, they've proven that at least in certain circumstances, the powers that be will reverse it. And of course there was collateral damage. There was an innocent guy who paid over uh, you know, who, who accepted Bitcoin and gave somebody the title to his car and then got caught up in the reversal and then lost his, or not Bitcoin in this case, Ether, but lost his Ether. Um, and nobody talks about the collateral damage. So they proved that they'll reverse it if the incentive is sufficiently strong enough, they'll do it. And once, you know, that's that's like kind of Pandora's box. I mean, once it's open, I don't know if you ever get the lid down again. So I've pushed at that a little bit and say, these things are reversible if they care enough to do so. But then more broadly is the issue of right now, the incentive is to, um, you know, is, is to play fair. But keeping in mind that all the people that run the nodes and all the people that run the miners, they're not doing it because they care about preserving your wealth. They're doing it because they're pursuing their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. And this is a world of anonymity and everything else. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no honor. There's no gentleman, you know, there's just, I'm doing whatever's going to work. If the incentive ever changed, then, um, you know, people could lose, you know, whatever, but potentially everything. Um, the incentive would change in what way that where people, I mean, people are always going to be incentivized. They're incentivized by greed, essentially, right? So, so and, one, th one thing I've pushed on a bit is there's a hard cap of 21 million. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the closer and closer you get to that and the rate of of, of uh, producing more bitcoins is having, you know, there's an incentive on the miners to say, well, let's let's double that to 42 million. Mm -hmm. Now create a fork, blah 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 blah. You know, but if the incentives were to line up, I mean, there's nothing about the cryptography or the math. There's nothing about the universe that guarantees that can never do that. It just it just comes down to an article of faith that the well, hey, would never, or that if they did, everybody would reject that fork. Mm -hmm. Well. You know, circumstances can change such that what's inconceivable today is happening tomorrow. And if, if I needed a better example of that, I could hardly be given a better one on a silver platter than COVID lockdown. If you had asked me, even in the end of 2019, could all the governments in the world simultaneously lock everybody down and just shut down commerce and shut down travel and, you know, shut down even the offices and the restaurants? I would have said, what are you smoking? There's no way. And then like within a week in you know, early March, 2020, that happened. And so could this happen? It could happen. And and will it happen? I don't know. Maybe it's a question of when, maybe it's a question of if, um, you know, I, I, all, all I can say is that's not the same thing as saying the cryptography has been proven. No one can steal your key. No one can reverse engineer your key. That's been proven. I mean, unless you make a mistake and hackers get it by a keystroke logger or whatever, that's been proven. This other thing has not been proven, and it's taken as if it were proven through kind of a Mott and Bailey switcheroo, uh, you know, fallacy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and should this happen, then obviously there's going to be a rush to the exits. And uh, if there's a rush to the exits, then the first, you know, he who exits first exits best. And... Um, I have to say, unfortunately, I'm out of time because I have a dinner reservation. No, oh, no, mm -hmm. I, I could have talked to you for a lot longer on this. This is this is good stuff. I, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, and I hope we cover it as as much as you wanted to. And if not, um, we can book, you know, a time and do sort of part two. Okay, um, okay. I'm, I'm happy to 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 talk and share and respond I, to questions I, and all that. I, to to leave a teaser for the do you do you hold any crypto? Do you use any crypto? I do not. Hmm. 
Okay. And so are, are I assume so that you're familiar at least with Monero and the differences between Monero and Bitcoin? I mean, as a layperson, I, I certainly couldn't tell you at a, at a technical level what's what's working differently. But yeah, I, I get the, the value proposition. And... All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I I, uh, I don't want to take up any any more of your time. I think I think we could continue at some point. Uh, I, I I feel like we were we were heading somewhere there. Um, so maybe maybe at another date we could we could do a part two and maybe yeah, between, now, between now and then maybe you could uh, in research Monero a little bit more. Download a, a Monero wallet. I'll s- I'll send you some Monero to get you started there to just to pique your interest. Send you down the rabbit hole a little bit. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Keith. Where can right. people learn more about you and follow you? And Yeah. So my company is Monetary Metals. It is monetary-metals.com. We're the company that pays interest on gold in gold. All right. Thank All you right. so much, Matt. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.